Okay, good morning. So, okay, December is finally here. The Christmas season, we can start the countdown and hopefully the building lights will change to red and green tonight. So, we'll see. So, I thought they were going to change the day after Thanksgiving, but they didn't, so hopefully it's this Friday. In any case, uh, my name is Christopher Orwell. I am the executive director here at the museum. Uh, most of you have seen before. We do have a couple of new faces, as always. Um, just so everybody knows, I always start my lectures out with a quote. Um, so, first of all, uh, ray guns, robots, and rocket ships. I'm not going to teach you about ray guns. I'm not going to teach you about robots. I'm not going to teach you about rocket ships. Today's to talk about science fiction. And I'll explain why here in a moment, why we're talking about science fiction at a space museum. Most people can probably figure out the connection, but it goes a little bit deeper for us. In any case, though, I have never listened to anyone who criticized my taste in space travel, sideshows, or gorillas. When this occurs, I pack up my dinosaurs and leave the room. <laughs> Ray Bradbury. So. Okie doke. Nice picture of the museum. Just kind of a pretty day. It's a learned day. So, in any case, though, for those of you who haven't met me before, so I grew up in Downey, California, where they built those things. Uh, in any case, uh, nobody in my family worked on it, but my wife's dad um, did work on the program. She worked at Rockwell for a period of time as well. In any case, um, they, the astronauts used to come back from the missions. 1972, the Apollo 16 crew has come back. There's John Young, and there's me. I mean, I ju just shook his hand a moment before, so, and there's my mom who passed away um, uh, last year, so, and she used to take me to all the times when the astronauts would come back. So, in any case, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1986, drove these things around for 20 years, did ballistic missile submarines, attack submarines, and diesels, uh, and spent time kind of all over the world, so, and then retired in 2006, planned a trip for my family to uh, Wichita, and to visit some museums in the zoo, etc., ended up running one of the museums. Strange coincidence. So in any case, though, did that for almost six years and then came down here to take over at the museum. I have a beautiful wife, nine children. This picture was taken many years ago because that guy's now 15. <laughs> um, uh, in any case, though, but I use this picture because I sent it to space as well with Steve Bowen, um, <clears throat> who was a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy, fellow submariner, and who most recently commanded the Crew-6 mission up to the space station and came back here just in the last um, uh, couple of months. So, and um, there they are landing um, out in the ocean in one of the SpaceX uh, craft. In any case, though, he'll be coming here um, next year so to speak as well. In any case, we've already talked to him about it. He's all excited about it as well. So, in any case, though, there we go. Fantasy is the impossible made probable. Science fiction is the improbable made possible. So a lot of people put science fiction and fantasy together. Oh, yeah, that's kind of a tough stretch because they are different genres. Um, we're going to be talking about science fiction. We're really not going to be talking about fantasy. Sometimes they do overlap. So sometimes writers use science fiction in fantasy and fantasy in science fiction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they're really not the exact same thing. Rod Serling as well, should recognize that name from the Twilight Zone. So in any case, great science fiction TV show. Touch on that later. In any case, though, so we're going to kind of, let me go back to leave this one up here. So, so the reason that we're talking about this today is that we have a new exhibit opening up on December 15th called Science Fiction, Sci-Fi and Sci-Fact. It's talking about how the two realms constantly are influencing each other. So, we've been doing a lot of work on science fiction, talking about it, writing about it, everything. The exhibit's being constructed um, just up above, uh, just the floor right up above us here. Um, and uh, like I said, opens up to the public on December 15th. And then we're actually going to open up a small version of it up in the Governor's Gallery uh, in January on the 16th as well. And it'll be on display in the Governor's Gallery in the Capitol Building from January through April. So we've been working on this quite a bit, um, uh, if you couldn't imagine. So we're going to talk about kind of the history of science fiction, how the genre came to be what it is a little bit so, and then I'm going to talk a bit about sci-fi, sci-fact, you know, and I'm really going to talk mostly about how science fiction, a lot of things become science fact, because to be brutally honest, that's the more fun side um, to talk about. If you're expecting this to be an all-encompassing lecture about science fiction, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Okay, that is semesters of time to really go into depth. We are going to skim the surface skim the surface. We're going to be like a space draft coming in and hopefully we'll just kind of catch the edge of the atmosphere and then land eventually or maybe I'll go a little too shallow and we'll just bounce off. Who knows? You know, we'll figure out. You'll let me know at the end. In any case though, when you talk about science fiction, when you're talking about things prior to 1926, you really are talking about what they call proto-science fiction. 
not really science fiction, but science fiction. Um, and most people agree that the start of it really was, was, was in there, but a lot of the ancient stories that really have a connection to science fiction aren't science fiction. So I'm probably confusing the entire subject here. But you can go back to things like Babylonia and the Epic of Gilgamesh. It included some of the elements of what science fiction is, and I'll talk about that here in a bit. It had a fantastic voyage, it had a worldwide disaster, things like that. But was it truly science fiction at that point in time? Depends what your idea of science is during the eras. You know, what constitutes science in 1000 BC, you know, BCE, or 100 BC, you know, or uh, AD, et cetera. So in any case, though, these are things that, you know, kind of get classified on the edges of science fiction. So that's really where maybe it did start. But most people don't call that the beginning of science fiction as we know it today. So, proto-sci-fi. Um, some of the authors, when you go back in and you're talking about folks in the 18th century, um, uh, you can get Margaret, Ca Margaret Cavendish, jo Johannes Kepler. Yes, that same Kepler. So, um, one of the big books that he wrote really does classify in kind of as a science fiction book. Cyrano de Bergerac, well, we know his tales, you know, so. Um, and then Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels. Kind of science fiction in some aspects. So it was, once again, sort of science fiction, but not true science fiction as we know it. So what were the elements that kind of make up something being classified as science fiction. The main ones, and then it branches out from here tremendously. So, but the main ones, some sort of fantastic voyage, or writing about a utopia, utopian existence, a utopian country, a utopian world, a philosophical tale, more of a satire. Gulliver's Travels is a bit of a satire uh, in that. The Gothic ones, oh yeah, we'll talk about these two folks here in a second, and technological or sociological anticipation. And in America, this really he heads towards what we talk about as inventions. You know, new inventions are really what the Americans latched onto for their science fiction, whereas like the British writers um, that we might be familiar with um, or you might have heard of um, really t talked about the technological and soci sociological sides of it um, uh, a bit more. Anybody know who these two are? Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe up there. Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley. Okay. A lot of people say that science fiction did start with Mary Shelley when she wrote Frankenstein, okay? So, you know, in Frankenstein, reanimation of life using electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, in any case, so really a scientific tale. So you've got some of this technological or sociological anticipation, the gothic elements of it, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, here with Edgar Allan Poe um, writing, oh, shoot. A balloon voyage, it was a balloon voyage to the moon, um, and I forgot the guy's name. Um, it'll come back to me, so, that he wrote about, yeah, so somebody with a phone will look it up for me, so. Because um, uh, it's a fun, it's, the, the, the title of the book, or, or the story, is a lot of fun as well. So, in any case, though, writing about this great travel, this fantastic voyage as well, but a lot of it really was gothic in its, in the nature of it at, at that point in time, so. Um, this is actually um, the Frankenstein manuscript that uh, Mary Shelley wrote, so you can see how she was correcting everything. So this is the frontispiece um, from the book here, and there's a, essentially a, this is not actually an artifact, this one, so this is, this is a, a reproduction, but if you, and if you want to, you can come up and take a look at it afterwards, but it has that frontispiece um, on the inside of it, so, um, of, uh, of Frankenstein as well. So, and this was published in the early 1800s. So this period between the early 1800s and the mid-1800s still is falling into that proto-science fiction era. Did you find that name by chance? The Balloon Hoax? Balloon Hoax, no, oh. it was, it was like house? the incredible adventure of something, fall yeah, it, of Jonathan Fall, yeah, I can't remember. Okay. So, Arthur C. Clarke said, science fiction is something that could happen, but usually you wouldn't want it to. <laughs> Fantasy is something that couldn't happen, though you really wish that it could. So. Once again, kind of defining the difference between science fiction and fantasy. So, so in the mid-1800s, some of the authors that are coming into being now and writing the science fiction, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, okay, which we associate mostly with, well, we did, so, but wrote other stuff. Fitz James O'Brien wrote a book called The Diamond Lens about a guy who creates this lens, this super microscope, and he falls in love with a lady that he sees inside of a drop of water. You know, so you can kind of see the connections 
um, but it's still not true science fiction. Did you find it? The signal triumph of Mr. Mon Monk's Mason's flying machine? Not the one, but that's oh another God. one of his proto yeah, science yeah, fiction yeah, stories. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get there eventually. So, And then on the British side, these are Americans up here, Lord Lytton um, uh, over on the British side, so who became a lord later on So um, with his writings. Th these are folks who were writing in the 30s, 40s, 50s um, uh, of the 1800s. In the 1860s, the name that comes up, and here, Mary Shelley, my opinion, my opinion, not necessarily all the science fiction historians, really is the beginning of science fiction. So, But it truly came into its own to me, even though people don't talk about modern science fiction coming into its own until the 1920s, okay, and we'll get to that, is with Jules Verne here. Jules Verne really takes off with it. Okay, 1860s. Here's, here's just a few of his books. Five Weeks in a Balloon in 1863, Journey to the Center of the Earth, 1864, From the Earth to the Moon, 1865, Around the Moon, 1870, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Around the World in 80 Days, Rober the Conqueror, which um, uh, uh, Sikorsky talked about being his inspiration for creating the helicopter. So, and The Lighthouse at the End of the World in 1905, and he published many others in and around that. Short stories, books, novels, etc. That's him early in life and later in life. From the Earth to the Moon, um, uh, right here, uh, which uh, when we get and we're talking about film here and the mediums of sci-fi, you'll see an image from a, one of the films that was done in this one because that was one of the great stories. Does anybody know how he flew the folks to the moon in that? Cannon. Cannon. <laughs> Where was it launched from? My staff can't answer. <laughs> They've been working on it too much. Himalayas. Where did we launch to the moon from? Florida. Florida. Outside of what they called Tampa City. Um, uh, what they called Tampa City in the book. Um, the, uh, the amount of time that it took for the mission was not too far off from what the Apollo was. It was a three-person spacecraft. Uh, the cost for it, if you compared the numbers from what he put in his book to what really flew with NASA in the 1960s, it's almost exactly the same. There's some scary similarities, you know, so, and he, re he, re he researched a lot of the reasons why you launch from Florida. Oh, by the way, in the book, there's a, con there's a conflict between what two states Florida. that we actually had a conflict between on the space program? Florida and Texas. Florida and Texas. Yep. That comes up in the book as well, and the place that's, uh, that, 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 uh, that are having the conflict, the location in Florida, the location in Texas, is where Elon Musk is launching from now. So it's kind of scary how, you know, all of this is kind of coming to pass, so. Okie doke. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, with the possible exception of bad news, which obeys its own special laws. <laughs> Douglas Adams, does anybody know what book he wrote that most people are familiar with? Hitchhiker's Guide. Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, yep, so in any case. Okay, so as we continue on, and obviously you saw that, that Vern didn't just publish in the 60s, he published you know, well beyond that. These are kind of when the starts, start word for theirs. H.G. Wells is the next name that comes up, and these are the people, Shelley, um, Vern, Wells, we're going to get into the more modern folks in the early 1900s, etc. H.G. Wells is another one of what you call the fathers or mothers of science fiction very easily. The Time Machine, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Invisible Man, War of the Worlds, First Men in the Moon, The Food of the Gods and How It Came to Earth, In the Days of the Comet, The World Set Free, and The Shape of Things to Come. Pretty much most of us have seen these as movies, you know, as well, because they're great stories. And they've been able to turn them into very successful movies as well. You'll notice I've got a dot, dot, dot here after 1898. Does anybody know why I have a uh, dot, dot, dot there? It was a serial first, but it wasn't published in 1898. When was it published? After the radio numbers? Radio, yeah, wasn't a thing at that point in time, so. Uh, it was just the year before, 1897. So, but it was actually published in 1897. You can touch this because it's wrapped in plastic, so. In any case, though, um, in a couple of places. One was in Pearson's Magazine in England. Two was in Cosmopolitan 
here in the United States. It looks a little bit different than it does now. <laughs> Whole different focus on it, you know, all, all stories and stuff. Although on the, ad, on the back there's an advertisement for Burnett's cocaine for the hair. <laughs> and ivory soap. Been around for a while. In, in any case, though, and you'll see, see on here, War of the Worlds, you know, so, and this, this is May 1987. <laughs> this, was, this was the first. In, in England, it published in April, and then went April through November. This one went May through December um, uh, uh, of the year. So, but this is where War of the Worlds was first published. A lot of the science fiction is first published in serials like that. Um, sitting next to this on the table here is. Um, a copy of the Pearson's magazine. There's three of them that are bound here, but it's opened up and you can see some of the illustrations that they did um, back in the day, which hopefully, yeah, you'll see this illustration is, or excuse me, that illustration is on one of the pages there. So, <clears throat> and this is a page from Pearson's magazine. There's the copy of, uh, of the cover from April and here's the May one that I was just holding up right there. So, by the way, these things are going on. So, you're getting a little bit of a preview. Science fiction is the most important literature in the history of the world because it's the history of ideas, the history of our civilization birthing itself. Science fiction is central to everything we've ever done, and people who make fun of science fiction writers don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Ray Bradbury. And science fiction has been mocked almost forever. Not nowadays. Nowadays it's mainstream, completely mainstream. Um, but in the day, it was seen as, you know, that wasn't necessarily, you know, the, uh, the true literature. So as we start to get into science fiction, we start talking about the 1900s. And I'm going to talk about 1926 specifically because this is where most sci-fi historians say the true science fiction that we look at today, this is when it came into being. So, and it came into being really with what we were seeing in, in, in pulp magazines, like Amazing Stories um, up here. Hugo Gernsback um, was the one who um, was the publisher. For amazing stories, got many of the authors of his days. You know, yes, he pulled stuff. H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Edgar Allan Poe. Sound familiar? We were talking about, you know, these folks. But he was also pulling from authors of that day um, as well for for that. He called it the mag magazine of scientific fiction. So now you start to get into him being a big person in this world, up and coming world of science fiction, which isn't really called science fiction at this time. You can find a couple of references of people calling it science fiction. But you hear more of this at that point in time, scientific fiction. So, and then it morphs as we head into the 1930s, and science fiction comes into being as a term and as a true genre. And it really does. It takes off, but not to the latter part of the 1930s. There is a low ebb at the beginning of the 19 or the uh, the beginning of the 1930s. Um, the science fiction stories and pulps are only about two to three percent of what's being put out at that time. By the way, does anybody know where the term pulp magazine comes from? The paper. It's the paper. The paper was made out of brown pulp, you know, so it was, it was cheap paper that they made it out of. So, um, and generally they were characterized by being a smaller publication. The spines on them were square, so as opposed to the other types that were the glossies um, of the day. So in any case, that's, that's where the term pulp uh, magazine um, and then eventually pulp science fiction, pulp fiction, things like that come from. Some of the, uh, the writers that are coming in and you know publishing and amazing stories and others, C.S. Lewis, should sound vaguely familiar, Sinclair Lewis, Vladimir Nabokov, Herman Woke, William Goldling, John Collier. So these are some of the bigger names um, of the day. In 1937, Astounding, which has kind of multiple names, you know, so eventually it does settle in on Astounding Science Fiction. Um, but it's in, uh, Astounding Science Fiction uh, is bought out by John W. Campbell. It had been ast Astounding before that. He renamed it Astounding Science Fiction. In any case, though, he starts working with some of the big officer, uh, the authors of the day. Um, and gets them and they're writing science fiction so and these are some of the names that we now look back and say oh these are the more modern fathers and mothers of science fiction so Isaac Asimov may not have sound vaguely familiar James Blish who wrote tons of science fiction and then eventually got into the Star Trek world and wrote all of the early Star Trek books and, and worked on all of that Arthur C. Clarke, Frederick Pohl, Robert Heinlein so and I love Heinlein because he's a Naval Academy graduate so, in any case, though, uh, who served his time and then got into the, to the uh, writing business, in any case, though, and was a very prolific writer. These are just some of the fun covers um, that were on the, the, the pulp magazines at the time. 
It's difficult to do an exhibit where you're putting these things on display. Why is that? Because the light will harm the... Well, that's, that's, that's a problem with every artifact. So, and if you ever want to see an example of that, we have an artifact on display on 3A in the Human Space Flight Gallery that was previously up on floor 5B, which gets indirect sunlight on the backside of the museum, so it doesn't even get the southern or western look. And it had small openings into the gallery, and it's an in-flight garment from the Apollo program. Uh, but you can see the pictures below, and then the actual artifact itself, you can see how much it has faded. So just from the indirect light, which is why we've been closing off the, the windows on the museum. So as to protect the artifacts, and you have to be careful about the light you have on them, etc. But that's not the reason. Oh, so, women in underwear being oh, attacked by aliens. Yeah, it's it, it is yes. So many of the covers are misogynistic, okay, sexist, and really hot. You know, so no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> In any case, though, yes, many of the covers are not things that you really want to put on display unless you're literally trying to teach about, you know, the era. And that's one of the things. We don't hide it, but it makes it a little bit more difficult. You have to be a little bit picky and choosy about what you put on display with these old pulp magazines. Um, uh, and, and this has been true forever. So women in science fiction in a lot of the early days were the damsels in distress. They were the assistant, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's just here in the last 30, 40, 50 years that they have started to become the heroes, heroines, excuse me, of the stories. How inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is clearly ocean. <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke. So, mediums of sci-fi. So we kind of, that, that brings us up. I'm not going to, we could spend forever talking about all the books and authors and everything else and the, and the people that are writing science fiction then, now, etc. And, and like I said, we don't, have enough, we don't have enough time for all of that. So I'm going to go in. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the mediums of sci-fi. So what are these things that become science fiction? Well, we've been talking about books for a while. We started to talk about the magazines and the pulps, you know, so in, Pulps really are magazines, I realize it, but there is some slight difference between, um, uh, between the two of them. So these we've been talking about. There's examples of them right over here. There's also, you know, once again, here you, you know, I talked about, you know, inappropriate covers, you know, so somewhat strange things. He's in a space suit and he's actually a space rocket and she's in a bathing suit. <laughs> flying through space, you know, so, but the, but the pulp magazines, you know, so we talked about, you know, how things were published in these back in the 1860s. Books, you know, you've got, you've got tons of them. You get into, to, you know, greater authors here that are more recent, Octavia E. Butler. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? And for what reason? I'm going to eliminate you because you're kind of sort of museum staff, you're a volunteer. What was her name used for recently? By NASA. Not to name a building, to name the landing spot for the Perseverance rotor, rover. The landing site was called the Octavia E. Butler Station. So, in any case, though, so, and even here, New Mexico authors, uh, this one's really not an antique, so I have no problems touching it um, at the moment. So, in any case, though, Rebecca Roanhorse, who is a New Mexico author, uses Navajo themes inside of her science fiction. Cool, you know, so a lot of fun um, with things like that. So, yeah, so books, magazines, pulps. <laughs> Comics. Right. We get into comics as well. So, and I've got a Buck Rogers, 2429 AD. So, and you can see the rockets and everything. Once again, this is being written in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Have we flown in space yet? No! Dr. Goddard's barely gotten rockets up, you know, thousands of feet up into the air, you know, at, at, you know, at these points in time. In any case, but we're writing about the idea, science fiction writers are dreamers. They're thinkers, they're anticipators, you know, etc. So it's kind of fun with uh, with with, uh, with all of the comics um, that uh, that come out. Buck Rogers, if you go back and take a look at the Apollo astronauts in like the documentary The Wonder of It All and, and some other ones, um, to a person, they almost all say Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, those were their influences for getting into aviation and space. So it's that, you know, does science fiction influence real life? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, big time. 
So now, you know, so the, uh, the, the, we're, we're going to get into stage and film. So, um, yes, there are stage plays in the early 1900s that are about science fiction. We've got them now. Heck, Stranger Things has got a play that they're doing right now. That's science fiction on stage, you know, so, and that's going on, going on in New York. So, but we get into film. This is one of the, the ones to me that was a big influencer in the early days. So, La Voyage dans la Lune, Trip to the Moon. So, done by Georges Méliès. So there's a there's a, a, um, a, a fun movie out there that uh, uh, fictionalizes the story of of, of him. So um, and if you get a chance to see it, Hugo, um, a lot of fun, really good, really really good movie. Um, and in the mini HBO miniseries from the Earth to the Moon, the last episode splits between the Apollo 17 mission and a retrospective looking back at Apollo 17. And then the third element of the story is a recreation of Melier, who's played by Tom Hanks in that, creating this movie. So, and he had a studio there in France, all windows all around, it was like a giant greenhouse, etc. But these are a couple of stills from it. So where, you know, covered somebody in essentially pie cream, you know, so, and then we're taking the photos and then they stopped it and stuck the missile, the, the, the bullet that was shot at him. So, um, at the moon, I should say. So, yeah, lots of fun. And then, I'm not going to spend time going into all the movies that came after that one. Once again, semesters worth to go through through all of them. So, um, and there's a, a billion of them. So, there are plenty of images of women in science fiction. There are hardly any women. So, that kind of just follows on with, you know, so that quote was said a while ago. It's better now. So, okay. Um, so the, the next thing, radio. So uh, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, became radio programs as well. Probably one of the most famous radio programs dealing with science fiction was? War of the Worlds. That Orson Welles did. Anybody know what day it was done? Halloween. Day before Halloween. So October 30th, 1938. So, <laughs> in any case, though, and they did the, uh, um, uh, did the program, there's a lot of disagreement among historians about did it really create any sort of panic or was this more publicity being done by CBS etc so uh, regardless there was some panic people thought it was real because they played it out like it was a live radio broadcast of a Martian invasion of the earth <coughs> now, yes they did have breaks in it Yes, they did say at the beginning that this is, you know, science fiction, and at the end they talked about it as well. So, because um, it was also it was also broadcast on the 31st, so it was it was both days, and some people didn't get it on the 30th. That's why there's the yeah. In any case, though, so yeah, kind of a fun fun thing going on. So with with radio, so television follows on as one of the great mediums of sci-fi. Yeah, it starts back in the 1950s. So space patrol. Up here, and if you ever get a chance, they're on. You're on YouTube. Yeah. Go back and watch some of the early episodes of this. They are a hoot. <coughs> so, because we think about what we see now as science fiction, and how much technology goes into it, and computer generation, and everything. Well, needless to say, they did not have that. So, you know, the leaning, you know, the the, the sets that really just look. You almost like, is that made out of cardboard? <laughs> you know, you kind of wonder. So, but this was hugely popular. Hugely popular. This guy's his facial expressions are hilarious. Um, uh, throughout it, he's the co-pilot um, on it. So um, we get into Lost in Space in the 1960s, which actually wasn't color first; it was black and white first, and then went to color. But I love the colors um, uh, in this one. So in the 1960s, Star Trek. So I want to talk about sh starting to show ways that you can change society through science fiction, which has always been one of the elements of science fiction uh, also so is the integration of the crew um, with you know Asian African American you know white it's aliens you know work, uh, everybody working together so pretty crazy so in the 1970s and 80s you know and it, who's this guy six million dollar man. man Steve Rogers so in any case though so right what's the noise close no 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 which also is used in Caddyshack, that's another story. So, so, Battlestar Galactica that we get into in the 1980s, you know, so you got the eye going back and forth and the signs like, you know, by your command, you know, so, et cetera, so, and then, whoops, hit the wrong button here, so, um, down at the bottom here, something much more, much, much, much more modern, Stranger Things, um, uh, 
uh, science fiction uh, miniseries. It's into its fourth season. They're working on the fifth, etc. So, um, uh, so, and we're seeing this now. We've kind of gone from television, and now we're into streaming. That's what everybody's doing. So instead of having to read a book, go to the movies. Um, now, you can sit there with your phone. You know, while you're waiting on a break and watch science fiction or whatever else. So it's it's being used for that nowadays because that is available to us. Remember the comic strips that we were talking about, you know, that you, you would get in the newspapers? And the, by the way, there's a copy over here of Dick Tracy that we're going to put into it. Why are we putting Dick Tracy in the exhibit? What's that? Two-way wrist radio. So, yep, so in any case, so, you know, concept, you know, and think about what that you know, nowadays, you know, with the, with the modern day smart watches and things that we have. In any case, though, one of the ways you can actually read comics about science fiction is on your phone, once again, streaming it. So, Webtoons is one of the, uh, the, the platforms that has a whole bunch of science fiction on it. One of them being Space Boy. Um, and you can see here they got kind of these virtual reality glasses that they wear in it as well. And it's about a deep space mission, so it's really sort of a love story. But there's, yeah, once again, that happens in science fiction a lot too. Um, but in any case, though, another New Mexico author. So, um, uh, Stephen McCraney, who lives up in Albuquerque, uh, is the creator of Space Boy. So, and it's one of the most popular uh, webtoons, uh, uh, cartoons on webtoons. So. In any case, I created the Oasis, and in this situation is, is Ernest Klein, who's the Ready Player One. Um, this was in the book. I created the Oasis, where you can go in and live virtually, because I never felt at home in the real world. I didn't know how to connect with the people there. I was afraid for all my life, right up until I knew it was ending. That was when I realized, as terrifying and painful as reality can be, it's also the only place where you can find true happiness, because reality is real. <laughs> and in the movie, it also says, in, in the book, says, it's the only place you can get a good sandwich. <laughs> Everything science is science fiction until someone makes it science fact. How they influence each other. And yes, science fact does affect science fiction. What we see in science fiction nowadays. Yes, ma'am. I wrote a science fiction novel 30 years ago. Almost all of the science fiction stuff that's in that is... Now reality. Now reality. Yep. Yes. Yep. Most science fiction writers take what exists in the world and what is being talked about, potentially being created, and utilize things like that in their stories. That's been going on for forever. But sometimes it's just pure imagination. And we'll get, we'll get into that here as we're talking about this topic specifically. So, find a fact. And whew, this is just a few. <laughs> just a few. Once again, we, we could spend forever talking about this one. We don't, we all don't have that much time. So, in any case though, AEDs, defibrillators, there's one sitting down there at the end of the table. You see them everywhere you go nowadays, on the wall, AED, up there. Kind of the idea for this and the first writing about doing something like this, boom, restarting somebody's heart, okay? And actually here, defibrillators, because the AEDs are a offshoot of the original defibrillator, which was somebody literally taking a battery and boom, Shocking somebody's heart happened back in the 1950s when somebody, when a kid um, had an issue on an operating table. In any case, though, where was that first written about? The idea of that? Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, 1818. Slightly before when it was actually used. <laughs> Credit cards. So um, I don't have a copy of the book here. So, but there's a book called uh, Looking Back. It was written in 1887. And it's looking back, and then in parentheses after that, 2000-1887. It's looking, somebody in the future in 2000, looking back at 1887. And it talks about the first use of credit cards, essentially being used to pay for things. And the merchant and the person buying the materials got a receipt from it as well, you know. So eerily similar to what we're doing is now. Now, he got a lot of stuff wrong. And, you know, Edward Bellamy, who wrote the book, got a lot of stuff wrong in there as well. He said that the United States was going to be a utopian, a socialist utopian paradise. <laughs> That's not us. <laughs> so, in any way, shape, or form. So, tablet computers. So, sometimes it's not just books that we're talking about. Sometimes it's other areas where things are, you know, these, anybody remember what these were called? In the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which is what this image is from which was done in 1968, long before the iPad or any of the other pads ever came into existence. They were called news pads. Mm. And eventually we had the iPad, you know, so. So in any case though, iPad, Star Trek had the PADDs. So um, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, they used, if you go back to the original Star Trek, they had 
pads that they used as well. So they actually, you know, Spock even had a calculator, and if you go back and look at it, it's ridiculously non-useful, but it was colorful, you know, so it had, I think it had eight buttons on it, you know, so, and they were just colors. So when he could do all these calculations with it, you know, and I'm looking at it going, and this was when we were using slide rules. Pocket calculators, calculators didn't exist outside of giant computers at that point in time, so. And then most recently here, um, uh, you know, this is just yet another example. This is the movie Passengers that had Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence in it. Yes, we have some costumes from that movie that will be going on display um, uh, eventually. But you can see him here, him holding that pad. This is what he was holding. So this is one of the props from the movie. With brand placement on it as well, it's got Sony on it as well so and you're looking at it going okay how do they get the image computer generated graphics you know so but but yeah that's a prop from the movie passengers so i'm waiting for the tricorder to be ah <laughs> wait i'll talk about that here in a second <laughs> In other news, it's seven souls till the harvest, and I still haven't prepared. For starters, I need to make a hoe. Also, I need to make an outdoor shed for the potatoes. I can't just pile them up outside. The next major storm would cause the Great Martian Potato Migration. <laughs> said by Mark Watney in the book, uh, The Martian, written by Andy Weir. Great book. That is one of, to me, one of the shining examples of science fact being put into science fiction. Because the story is science fiction. You know, about what happens, the disaster, and, and all the tales. It uses a ton of concepts of how space flight could actually be done. We haven't flown to Mars. We haven't set up bases on Mars yet. But people are working on it. So Andy Weir took that research and turned it into a really, really good book. So, yes, he got things wrong as well. But And the movie got a couple of things really wrong. No, you can't puncture your glove and fly through space. Okay, puncture glove, die. Right. Okay. <laughs> In any case, smartwatches. Yep, once again, Dick Tracy here with the. And I love in the comics how they always need to write two way wrist radio and point at it. If you ever see him using it, it always two way wrist radio and pointing at it, you know? It's, just, it's like they constantly figure people have not read this before, so, and, and that's the way it always was. And yes, you could look at the size of that thing, you know? So, um, uh, and then a smaller, smaller version here. Uh, but yeah, nowadays, you know, and then eventually it was, it was a two-way wrist radio, and then eventually it was a two-way ri wrist radio television as well, so we could video communicate. So um, nowadays with smartwatches, we don't think too much about it. Yeah, you can have a smartwatch, and you can talk and do everything else. Yeah, but back when this was written in the early 1900s, so yeah, a little different. Did, that technology was not, we didn't even have transistor radios yet when this was written. Radios were big, big. Bigger than that, <laughs> a lot bigger, so. Drones, anybody know what book really spent a lot of time talking about drones being used? Ah, shoot, I put it right here, I forgot. <laughs> anybody know, sorry. <laughs> Dune by Frank Herbert, so it talks about swarms of drones, you know, so we think about, we thought about for a long time mostly just single drones, but take a look, you know, so swarms of drones being used for combat, being used for fireworks types displays. That's where you see a lot of them nowadays. You see these things flying through the air and making images um, uh, up there. And the computer controls of those are absolutely amazing. So, and the fact that they all do this in synchronicity. So, absolutely amazing. Tasers. <coughs> and yes, sitting over here. The, whoops. There is, inside here, a taser gun. So, um, with an expended cartridge in the bars on it. So. In any case, so nobody can pick it up and shoot it at anybody. Um, uh, in any case, though, <clears throat> besides my staff, does anybody know how the taser came into being before I talk about it? No? Nope. No? Nope. Actually, it was, it was a NASA um, uh, scientist so, who was a big fan of the Victor Appleton series, Tom Swift. Tom Swift was a series of the boys' books um, that existed back in the early 1900s, 1911s, through the 20s. In any case, though, one of the books he wrote was Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle, where Tom Swift is traipsing through Africa, runs into all these issues or whatever, and creates and invents an electric rifle that he can shoot somebody. Well, our, in, our intrepid inventor sat there and said, hmm, that's a neat concept. I think I could make that. So he did. He actually created what we now know as the taser, you know, where it basically 
shoots out two prongs, sticks into somebody, 80,000 or more volts, you know so, and muscles as they freeze, boom, down. But you don't need to shoot them and kill them. That has saved more lives than probably anything else in the law enforcement world, is the invention of the taser in the 1970s. The fun thing is, is how the name came about, because you'll notice it's all capitals, which means it's an acronym. Thomas A. Swift and his electric rifle. <laughs> In case you didn't know that. That's where Taser came from. It was an homage to, to that. Today we live in a society, uh, Philip K. Dick, another great writer, so, uh, Philip Dub, yeah, K. Dick, excuse me. Um, if you've seen the movie, uh, 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 sorry, where Arnold Schwarzenegger goes to Mars. Total Recall. Total Recall, thank you. So get your, ah. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to finish that. Get your rear end to Mars. So, in any case, that's a difficult one to do the Arnold Schwarzenegger without saying the whole thing. <laughs> and I don't want to do that while we're filming. So, um, in any case, though, today we live in a society in which spurious realities are manufactured by the media, by governments, by big corporations, by religious groups, political groups. So I ask, in my writing, what is real? Because unceasingly we are bombarded with pseudo-realities manufactured by very sophisticated people using very sophisticated electronic mechanisms. I do not distrust their motives, I distrust their power. They have a lot of it, and it is an astonishing power. That of creating whole universes, universes of the mind, I ought to know. I do the same thing. That's very meta. <laughs> right there for one thing. Um, and. A lot of his books are like that also. They've made Tom Cruise movies out of some of his books, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, they're really, really, some of his stuff is excellent. Okay, next thing, VR glasses. There's a pair of them sitting over there. Um, we're used to seeing people, you know, putting on VR glasses. And yeah, a lot of the fails that you see if you watch funny videos on the internet are people, you know, it's like, yeah, whack, you know, and hit the television or fall or whatever else, you know, because they're, you know, doing stupid stuff with VR glasses. One of the neatest things I did with VR glasses not too long ago was walked on the surface of the moon. So in it, they created an enclosure kind of thing, cameras all around. You put on the VR glasses, gloves, etc., so we could track what your hands, feet, etc., were doing. And as I'm walking, you know, you had limits. They had a limit of where you could go, so that you didn't walk into the wall kind of thing. So, but yeah, walked on the surface of the moon. It's pretty wild. So, um, but the concept for that came from a pulp magazine. Um, that was written, um, where an article inside of it was called Pygmalion Spectacles. And it talked about, you know, the, the, the VR glasses and how a virtual world was implanted on the, uh, on the eyeballs of the person who was wearing them. <coughs> Domestic robots. So, Rosie the Robot. So, nowadays we have Roombas. You know, we have other things that we utilize, small robots that help us take care of our households. One of the more fun, also from the movie Passengers here, this guy was an android slash a robot, the bartender, so with essentially artificial intelligence as well as he was talking to the people who were on board um, the, uh, the vessel. So yeah, we are, we are utilizing these in our everyday lives now, um, but a lot of this was conceptualized either in books or in television shows like The Jetsons. A good science fiction story should be able to be predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam. <laughs> Not just the technology, but how it affects society. That's really a hallmark of science fiction. Yeah. Well, cell phones. Okay, this is... I'm trying to remember. I'm just going... Yeah, okay. Oops. So I wanted to make sure and see what was next, though. So, okay, so when cell phones first came out, we were used to seeing either the car phone, the big gigantic bag with the phone and everything, but the first portable cell phones... So... Brick phone. The brick, okay? Yeah. This was the Microsoft um, Dynatac. TAC, total area coverage. So it was Dyna and then capital T-A-C at the end of it. So, you know, this, this one was obviously it's hooked up with the car battery, but it also did have a portable battery as well. For those of us who are obviously a little bit older, we remember these when they first came out. They were expensive as well, $4,000, which comes out to about $12,000 in modern day money. So, yeah. In any case, though, and that was in the, 1989 is when those started to come out. And then we went to the MicroTac, much smaller, you know, smaller phone. Flip down, the speaker for the, for the mouthpiece was right here. Very easy to break this off too, you know, for those of us who had them, you can, you can remember those. So, um, uh, and also my favorite, the pull-out antenna, you know, so as well, but a lot smaller, a lot easier um, to carry around, you know, yeah, sort of pocket size, but you know, that's a, 
Not exactly so, but you know, once again, micro tack, total area coverage. So, then in, in, in the mid 1990s, we finally got to this. Now, this should look very familiar because flip phones are still in use nowadays. This was the first flip phone. And the folks who created it for, um, for Motorola, who did all of these phones right there, and oh, by the way, you know, flips up like that, like we're used to seeing. You know, like that. And why do I do that motion? Star Trek. Star Trek. Bingo! Because of this. <laughs> it was Star Trek. Kirk Enterprise, Kirk Enterprise. <laughs> Anybody notice the similarity between these two? <laughs> the name of this is the StarTac, in homage to Star Trek. So Motorola actually did that on purpose, and the inventors did that on purpose because it looks so simil similar size-wise and everything else. Lots of fun. And I set my, there we go. <laughs> the last one I'll talk about, portable audio. So. Um, Fahrenheit 451, probably heard the story. Inside that book is written about these, these uh, um, small headsets, these seashells that can give you the, uh, um, the sound of you know, walking around in a world of music and talk and everything else. Once again, at this point in time, we didn't even have portable radios. It wasn't until a year, over a year after that, that the first portable radio came out. The transistor radio. This is one of the first transistor radios right here. Um, uh, Regency TR1. This is a TR1G. So this is one of the later models. This one's going up to the Capitol building. The TR1 that we have that's still on its way to us um, uh, is going to go in our exhibit here. Um, so the governor can have the later model. Um, <laughs> in any case, one of the fun things about it when you look at this up here, you'll see a couple of little marks on the dial. And there's two marks on there. Does anybody know what those were for? Conrad. Conrad. Very good. And what was Conrad? Alert system. It was the it was the radio broadcasting system, the alert system for if there was a, essentially a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. So, in any case, but it had those marked on there. So, and eventually we have tape recorders that go to the moon. This one did not go to the moon. So this is actually one in my, in my collection. So this is one of the the styles of the Walkman. <laughs> not Walkman. Excuse me one of the small tape recorders that they actually were able to take. So the, the term Walkman didn't exist at that point in time. Okay, The Devil in the Dark. This was a Star Trek episode. Okay, and for those of you who are Star Trek aficionados, you know that this is the one where there was a creature that tunneled through, so, um, uh, through the rock and it was killing people. So, The Devil in the Dark impressed me because it presented the idea unusual in science fiction then and now that something weird and even dangerous need not be malevolent. That is a lesson that many of today's politicians have yet to learn. <laughs> so what we're working on right now, I talked about the exhibit. So this is what exists that we put in in 2016, an exhibit about Gene Roddenberry, who was inducted into the International Space Hall of Fame. And in the back of it, we had have, have a transporter. We have original props from the TV show. We had cases all around, hugely popular. Um, people loved, especially this back part back here, taking their picture inside the transporter, etc. And so when we, just pre-pandemic, just barely pre-pandemic, we're like, we need, to, we need to update this, you know, because it's been up there for almost four years now. How do we do that? So, um, and then the pandemic hit. And during that whole time frame, we conceptualized the idea of keep the stuff in the back here and talk about the broader concept of science fiction and science fact and how they influence each other. So we're leaving the Star Trek stuff in the back, putting some of the stuff that was in the front in the back, so we're really cramming that space back there. And then in the front part of it, we are putting in all new um, uh, exhibit stuff. This was more of what's in the back section in there. Where this is, this no longer exists, okay? There's graphics up here, there's giant cases up here, there's currently five, there's gonna be six eventually, that, that we're putting suits inside of, suits and costumes. So right now, sitting up on the floor up there that's been put in there already is Joyce's suit from Stranger Things, from season one, um, that was worn by Winona Ryder. Mal's suit from Serenity and Firefly, the TV show in the movie series. One of the Helio suits from the current Apple TV series for all mankind. And then also um, one of the Sokol suits that was worn by uh, the NASA astronaut when they sent Howard Wolowitz up to space in the Big Bang Theory. 
So, and there's going to be more in there. We have a ton of costumes and things. You know, the, the costume that's right here, this is just the jacket um, that was worn by Jake Busey in the movie Starship Troopers. Oh, cool. So, and we have two other costumes, one worn by Denise Richards and one worn by Casper Van Dien in that movie as well, that those three are all going to go on display in one of the cases up there. I was attracted to science fiction because it was so wide open. I was able to do anything and there were no walls to hem you in and there was no human condition that you were stopped from examining. Octavia E. Butler, one of the first African-American authors and, and, and the author of the Pattern Master series and now the namesake of the of the Perseverance landing site. So, two worlds collide, sci-fi, sci-fact. So, we've been acquiring, this is a half-scale model from the movie The Right Stuff. Underneath here, you just see the tip of it, is a giant five-foot section of V'ger oh, wow. from Star Trek The Motion Picture that we've been working on the lighting for and having a lot of fun working on that one. So, um, yeah, you know, costumes. Yep, R2's been helping us with the exhibit. He's not part of the exhibit. He's helping us create the exhibit. Okay, there's that Sokol suit from the Big Bang Theory. So it was worn by Mike Massimino. So we have uh, on display on the third floor, this was also used in a movie, the called First Man. So um, the story of Neil Armstrong's life, but that's a, re a you know a recreation, it was used in a movie. Joyce's suit from Stranger Things, this is when we did, it went down to the preview at, uh, at the uh, Comic-Con in El Paso. So, Mal suit from uh, uh, Serenity and Firefly. If you've seen Galaxy Quest, there's one of the Thermian costumes from Galaxy Quest. We also have Alan Rickman's costume oh, wow. cool. from Galaxy Quest that will be going on display. That will be going up to the Governor's Gallery, then coming back down here. This is from the TV show Eureka. It was one of the props used in there. There's costumes from Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt and a bar stool from that bar that you saw the robot bartender at. So, and then down below here is that pad that's sitting over there. So. These are things that are going on display eventually. So I've been telling the staff, it opens up in two weeks. Yes, it can be done. We can do it. We're just stressing over it right now. So big time. So and that was sitting on his desk. Science fiction is not prescriptive. It is descriptive. Ursula K. Le Guin, another one of the great authors of science fiction. So museum, one more thing. It's coming up here in a little over a week. <laughs> Sorry, had have to do it. So. so, and if you want to read more about kind of this science fiction, science fact, a couple of great books: the Encyclopedia of, or the yeah, Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, Illustrated Guide, and then the Science Fiction from Science Fiction to Science Fact. So, and I'll leave these sitting over here so you can take a look at them as well. Feel free to touch those as much as you want. And now, questions. That was fabulous. Cool. No questions. Wow. Thank you. you explained it all so well. <laughs> <laughs> then let, okay. Then let's have some. You mention the tricorder. Oh yes. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I did forget to mention the tricorder. So, and most everybody here has heard of the X Prize. So, which was what led us to having, you know, Virgin Galactic and Spaceport America here on the other side, because you had Spaceship One that was created to try and win the prize money that was part of the X Prize. And the X Prize was conceptualized because of the prize that was created way back when that led to the first transatlantic flight. So trying to create something similar for the space programs was the X Prize, to be able to fly a spacecraft up, within a few weeks, fly it again. So repeatability flying into space. So Spaceship One did it, up, back down. Well now X Prize has kind of, or, you know, that sort of thing has become one of those terms that get used, you know, they're going to have the blank X Prize, the blob X Prize, and a tricorder X Prize. And there was, essentially, there's been medical devices that have been created that, that one, what was the number of? 34. 34 different um, readings that it could take on the human body. It wasn't, the, what the work that they did on it, that this was the team that won, it didn't meet all of the criteria, but it met enough of them that they gave them a partial prize. So, um, and a partial award, and then set aside the rest of the uh, of the funds from it. So, but yeah, it was the the and Dexter. Dexter. Dexter was the name of the device that they created, and it was like capital D, small X, small T, capital E R. It looks really weird, you know. So, but in any case, so yeah, the tricorder concept in Star Trek, where you had the tricorder that could take readings from <coughs> the atmosphere and the planet and look for people and stuff like that, and then there was a little device you could pull out to talk to the tricorder. And he, you know, 
I'm a diabetic. I've got this little sensor on my arm that talks to my phone and gives all the information on my phone and my doctor can see that as well at any point in time. That's essentially a tricorder. Did that come out of the monitoring systems for just like the astronauts? A lot of things, yeah. They're, they're, yes. The answer is yes, not necessarily this, but because those were all wired systems, but they, a lot of things they had to do to monitor the astronauts were utilized in me medical technology. There's, there's a NASA um, magazine called Spinoff, used to be, and now they do it all online, etc., where NASA talks about all the different technologies, all the different inventions that have come out of, you know, the things that NASA does. That's another massive lecture in and of itself. So, let's have a little fun then. What is the name of the fake town where Truman is trapped in the Truman Show? <laughs> I'll open this up to staff as well, because you haven't heard these questions yet. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Nobody got that one. Sea Haven. I got prizes if you get any of this. So, a spaceship crashes in the desert of what U.S. state in the 1953 movie? It came from outer space. No. Mexico. No. Arizona. Yes. Who said Arizona? <laughs> Who said Arizona? You get a coaster from Oga's Cantina <laughs> at Walt Disney World. Thank you. You get a chance. Go in there. It's a blast. It's like stepping into a Star Wars cantina. What is Ripley's first name in the movie Alien? Most people know her by Ripley, but they don't know her first name. Helen. What, what, who, wait. Ellen. You're close. Ellen. Ellen. Oh, uh, What's that? Ellen. Ellen. Yep. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to you. So you get a caution abduction zone sticker. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> that's fabulous. Oh, you got what is the name of the artificial intelligence villain in the movie Matrix, the trilogy? Ah, it's Agent Smith, but you, you, yeah, you, you get it, so. You get a Star Trek Spock. Oh, nice. An homage to Dr. Smith. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that one, so Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. Oh, yeah. Talk about, yo, oh, I hated him. So, what is the name of the villainous artificial intelligence in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Hal 9000. Ah! Who said Hal 9000? Give it to him. Oh, okay. Who said Hal first then? I said Hal. You said Hal? <laughs> you get a lost in space, put together robot. <laughs> 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 Who played Snake Plissken in Escape from New York and Escape from Los Angeles? Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. Who said it? <laughs> you get a Mars keychain. <laughs> <laughs> Who played the President of the United States in the movie Independence Day? Bill Pullman. Ah, who said that? You said that one, so, yep, yeah, okay. You get from Doctor Who, a Dalek. Who directed the 1985 movie Cocoon? We're in the directors now. It's a very famous director. And it's not Steven Spielberg. Nope. Ron Howard. Ron Howard. You get one of our commemorative coins from when we, from when we moved the uh, Tornado aircraft. What cafe does Marty meet the bully Griff in, Griff at, in the movie um, Back to the Future Part 2? What's the name of the cafe that he goes into? Just gave you part of the answer. Oh, nobody got this one. Cafe 80s. Uh -huh. Cafe 80s. Okay, for bonus points here, does anybody know the future famous actor that he that he interacts with inside the cafe? Anybody ever seen the Lord of the Rings? Frodo? <laughs> the, the actor who played Frodo. Elijah Wood. Mm -hmm. Elijah Wood. 
was actually playing a, one of, a computer game inside of there. So, um, how many giga, gigawatts? Gigawatts. Does Doc say the time machine needs to power it in Back to the Future? What's it? 1.21. 1.21 gigawatts. <laughs> you get a... Oh my god, Houston, I have so many problems. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and that... Wait, wait, actually, no, we did have one more question. Excuse me? What speed does it need? If you've already gotten it, you know, so... We'll get we'll we'll give it to somebody else. What speed does the time machine have to reach in order to jump back jump in Back to the Future? Eighty eight miles an hour. Eighty eight miles an hour. So and you're gonna get the last prize, a Mars marble. So <laughs> Okie doke, any last questions before I turn it over to Kathy? You should do a trivia show at a bar where <laughs> <laughs> could have fun with it. So yes sir. I noticed when you were talking about the cell phones mm -hmm. that um, the Blackberry was important. And was that skipped over for a reason, or I mean? Really, I'm trying. The, the the because of the connection with Star Tac to Star Trek, I'm talking about the uh, um, the Motorola phones. So okay. yeah, yep. yeah, I stuck with the Motorola ones with the Dyna, the Micro, and the Star. Yep. So. Yep. Trust me, this lecture could go on for months, months, very easily of continuous lecture if we really <laughs> talked about everything. So, Kathy. I can say we need a budget for trivia prizes. <laughs> that was all my stuff. Because <laughs> I collect weird stuff. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today. It's great to see some new faces here. Uh, up and coming activities at the museum include the Astronomy League meeting, which has been moved forward a week to December 7th. Normally it's on the second Thursday. Uh, for December, it will be on the first Thursday, December 7th, because on the second Thursday, which is the 14th, the Astronomy League will be working with White Sands National Park on a sold-out star party. So I'm sorry you can't go to it because it's sold out, but still, uh, we're having our own star party the week before on December 9th, though. And you can come to that free. That is... Uh, 6 to 8.30 p.m. on Saturday, December 9th. It's free. It'll be in the uh, new observatory area. So uh, we encourage you to bring your friends and come up to that. Then on December 14th, if you are a member of the museum, you will be invited to an exclusive preview of our Sci-Fi and Sci-Fact Gallery. Then it officially opens to the public on December 15th. And then, because it's Christmas, we like to do everything. Um, December 16th, we'll be holding Holiday on the Hill. This is our second event uh, of this type. Last year, we had a great food drive. We look forward to another one this year. If you bring two cans of food, that gets you into the museum and to the theater for some special showings. Uh, there'll be activities on this floor for kids. They'll be doing things like um, uh, creating their own solar system Christmas tree ornaments and building air rockets and launching air rockets, weather permitting. Uh, and we'll also have a telescope demonstration. If folks are interested in purchasing a telescope as a gift or getting themselves one, or if they just need to know more about it as, as a beginner uh, with a telescope. So again, that is 10 to 3 on Saturday, December 16th, Holiday on the Hill. And our very next Launchpad lecture, which may or may not have trivia questions and gifts, uh, will be <laughs> Ranger, <laughs> Ranger and Mariner. This may be hard to get stuff to give yeah. away for. Yeah. Ranger and Mariner, all aboard with our education director, Michael Shinneberry. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a wonderful holiday, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.